Maybe I should start with just a quick, uh, brief introduction of who I am. Uh, Jose Oliva is my name. I was born and raised in Guatemala. Um, I was there until I was 13, 1985, you guys do the math. Um, the reason we came here was because my, my mom was a, a school teacher. Uh, she taught little kids, uh, first grade through third grade. And she taught in a schoolhouse about the size of this room. Uh, and she and her co-worker were the only two teachers in the school. So she taught first through third graders and pointed them in one direction. And her co-worker taught the fourth through sixth graders and pointed them in the other direction. Same room. Uh, most of the kids there were very malnourished. They, most of them had no shoes. I remember all of this because I remember when I didn't behave in my school, I would have to go to school with my mom. <laughs> Um, and one day she realized she and her co-worker got together and started talking about, you know, some of the you know, systemic issues of poverty that affected the kids. Um, and they said, well, you know, one good start would be if we had running water and electricity here in the schoolhouse, right? At least the kids could drink water. We could probably bring stuff that we could cook here for them. Um, and so they agreed that they would uh, start a petition and that they would walk that petition over to the mayor's house uh, demanding running water and electricity. Well, that little petition uh, got my mother branded a communist because, of course, who else wants electricity and running water in their schoolhouses? Well. So we had to leave Guatemala. My aunt, my mother's sister, was kidnapped and killed uh, as a result of my mother's petition. Um, as a warning to her. Uh, so we left, we left Guatemala. We came here, that was 1985. She was a school teacher. When, she, when we came here, her job was a restaurant worker. Uh, she started working in a restaurant in a suburb, northern suburb of Chicago. And for many years, I remember going to pick her up from work and looking inside the restaurant and loving the ambience, the environment of the restaurant, feeling like, wow, that's a really cool place to work, right? There's, it's fast paced, um, people are all friendly, there's this buzz about the restaurant. Um, so that was actually my first job when I was in high school as a restaurant worker. Um, throughout college, that's actually how I paid for college, was working the restaurant industry. Um, I was undocumented for about 26 years of my stay here in the U.S. Um, so I you know, had no loans or scholarships or anything to pay for that, for the college out of pocket. Um, and so during the course of working in the restaurant industry, I started to notice all of these uh, issues that happened. I don't know if anyone, has anyone here worked in the restaurant industry? Yeah. So there's some, there's some issues, you know, I'll describe them, but you guys probably know them very well, right? I started to notice that um, there was race differences in the way that people worked, what part of the restaurant white people worked in versus people of color. Um, I noticed some huge gender differences, right? And especially in uh, how women were treated by management versus the way men were treated by management. It was a, it was a stark difference. Um, and I noticed a ton of wage theft and occupational safety and health issues. Um, you know, and the reality of the restaurant industry for me was that it was just a wild, wild west, right? There was no enforcement of any laws. Uh, I didn't think that the restaurant industry um, was part of the regime of laws in the United States. I felt like somehow it had fallen through the cracks, right? And it just was this whole nether, nether world of uh, illegality, right? Um, I graduated college. I continued to work in the restaurant industry. Uh, and I was volunteering in a community organization in Chicago called Casa Guatemala. And a woman came in one day and said that her husband had been kidnapped. And I said, oh, you mean back in Guatemala? And she said, no, that happened here in Chicago. And I said, 
well, what do you mean? Did someone like, came to your house and kidnapped him? And she said, no, he went out to the parada and someone picked him up and never brought him home. And I said, well, what is this parada that you speak of? And she said, well, it's a street corner. Uh, for those of you who know Chicago, it's the street corner of Pulaski and Lawrence. And men go out there as early as 4 a.m. and stand and wait for essentially contractors to come and pick them up and take them to work. Um, completely uh, unmitigated market, right? So the contractor pulls up, says, hey, I need three workers to do a roofing job. The roofing job pays eight bucks an hour. Who can do it for less? And the workers will run up to the car who are willing to do the job for whatever the amount ends up being bargained. Um, I was blown away by this. It was to me like picking up the rock and seeing the creepy crawlies underneath because it made the connection immediately to the restaurant industry for me. I said, whoa, wait a minute. There is, it isn't just the restaurant industry. Uh, there's this whole nother economy that's developing under our economy, right? It's this informal economy. And it's not just that it's an informal economy. It's not just that it's a, you know, a, sort of a, all kinds of illegality happening in it. It's that it is becoming the dominant economy. <laughs> it's taking over, uh, if not the actual industries, the behaviors of those industries, right? So when you think about uh, the kinds of things that are actually pretty standard now in most workplaces, like time flexibility, right? Where you, you think of it as a good thing, but really what that means is that, you know, the, the employer can tell you when to come in, when not to come in. There's less control for workers than there was in the past when you had a specific time that, that you worked in. Um, there's tons more of divide and conquer, right? So the same um, realities that I described earlier with front of the house workers being one shade <laughs> and back of the house workers being a different shade, that is happening in all of our workplaces. Um, and then there is this reality of lack of enforcement equals wild, wild west, right? So most employers now realize that there aren't enough cops on the beat to catch them breaking the laws when it comes to labor uh, and employment laws. And so they test those waters more frequently. They figure out ways of either skirting the law or outright breaking the law and daring the DOL or OSHA or EEOC to, to catch them. Um, and oftentimes they don't get caught. So all of this is happening, uh, or, or all of this is giving me a sort of crash course, <laughs> a crash education um, on the realities of the workplace in this country. Um, and so I, along with a couple of other folks, decided that we were gonna form an organization of workers, and of course our industry was restaurants, so that's what we thought we would do as a worker organization in the restaurant industry in Chicago. Um, and we started organizing workers, what we thought was a brand new model of organizing that no one had ever thought of before. Um, and of course it was, and not only was it not new, there were a number of other organizations doing very similar work. Um, one of which I met in 2004 called Rock, the Restaurant Opportunity Center. And they came out of the, uh, the Twin Towers tragedy on 9-11. Uh, 73 workers died uh, on September 11th. Uh, September 11 in the 101st floor of the North Tower. Uh, those workers worked in Windows on the World. That was the name of the restaurant. Uh, and that restaurant was one of the few really good restaurants in probably the entire country. They had a, 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 they had a marvelous healthcare program. Uh, everyone, even back of the house workers, made no less than $13 an hour. Um, it, was a, it was probably one of the best restaurants to work in. So when the restaurant uh, collapsed, um, those workers that survived decided that they would honor the memories of the ones that died, the 73 brothers and sisters that died that day, and create rock as a way of creating the conditions they had at Windows in the rest of the industry. And so the strategy was three-pronged. There was 
organize bad employers. That is, identify bad actors in the restaurant industry, organize the workers in that restaurant, and demand uh, better conditions. Pretty simple. A second piece of the strategy was to organize good employers. That meant talking directly to owners of restaurants who were already providing good wages and good benefits to workers and bringing them together into a restaurant association of sorts that could speak from the restaurant owner's point of view as to why it was necessary to have good conditions and, and better wages in the restaurant industry. And the third piece was policy work. Uh, and it was all around creating a floor for the restaurant industry where, where none existed before, right? Or at least in theory it existed, but there was no enforcement to it. Um, and so the idea was, if you think of the restaurant industry as a pyramid, right? And fine dining restaurants are at the top, family style restaurants, franchises are in the middle, and quick serve fast food restaurants are at the bottom. What you do is you pull the top up through the first two strategies and you push the bottom up with that last strategy of policy work. Uh, and that is what's, what Rock has been doing since 2001, since uh, the tragedy. Um, they developed a, a whole another employer association that's called RAISE, Restaurant Tours Advocating for Industry Standards in Employment, that's what it stands for. Rock is the master of acronyms. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> there was a rock star program, yeah. which is a supporting transformation in America's restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so, so, you know, as we were doing all of this work at Rock, we started to notice more and more people, customers coming to us, telling us, um, you know, what's, where, where was this chicken grown? I guess uh, we've all seen that Portlandia episode, mm -hmm. I'm sure, right? What's the name of the chicken? <laughs> Customers becoming more attuned and aware and demanding better food and asking all the right questions, except for one. Okay. They never asked about the workers, right? They asked about how this food impacted their health, how it impacted the environment, how it impacted agriculture, but they never talked about workers in that, right? And so we started thinking about how do we insert workers into this ongoing discourse in the United States around food? Uh, and so together with Coalition of Democracy Workers, GATA, Brand Workers International, and a few other worker centers at first, we formed the Food Chain Workers Alliance with the explicit purpose, or at least one explicit purpose, of inserting workers into that ongoing discourse around food. And we were successful, or at least partially successful. We were so successful that we were able to shift the discourse of the food movement from one that was looking at issues of individual health and well-being to issues of equity, to issues of real systemic change for the food system, right? Um, you know, and I mentioned the three segments that we noticed, right? There are health folks who are concerned about how food concern, how food impacts the human body, environment, and agriculture. And then there's labor. So the four sectors of the food movement spell out the word heal. Um, and what we are trying to do at the Food Chain Workers Alliance is heal our food system, right? We're trying to create the kinds of policies in, from local municipalities to the federal government that will actually transform our food system from one that looks at profit as the ultimate motivator and the reason for the food system to exist to one of equity and the reality of food being a right and not a privilege. Food being something that we not only all need, but we all have direct ties because of our culture and our realities too. So, What's the Food Chain Workers Alliance? The Food Chain Workers Alliance is a coalition of 23 food worker organizations. Uh, we combined, combined all, the, uh, or the, all of the memberships of the organizations combined, we represent about 250,000 workers in the US, which is nothing compared to the size of the food system. The food system as a whole represent, or represents 
is 20 million workers big. Um, it's one sixth of our entire food or of our entire economy. One sixth of all the jobs in the United States are in the food system. It's huge. Um, and if you juxtapose that with the reality of the wages and conditions in the food system, it's stark. Uh, it's seven of the 10 <laughs> lowest paying jobs in the United States are in the food system. The top three are all in the food system. The lowest paid jobs are all in the, in the food system. Um, over two thirds of all the workers in the food system have to go to work sick because there's no paid sick days laws, right? And so people have to go to work because otherwise you don't get paid, right? Um, anyways, I can go on and on and list all of the, the tragedies of, of uh, food workers in the food system. What we want to see, or, or how we want to shift this reality is twofold. One, we want to create a cultural change, which I think is beginning to happen, where people don't just think about food um, as something of individual pleasure or nutrition, but that there's also connections to that food that go way beyond their individual portion, right? That there are human beings behind that food. That's a cultural shift that I do believe is happening. I think there's a lot more of that at least now than there was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Secondly, we want to see widespread uh, policy changes around the way food is procured by our municipalities. And so earlier today, I met with some uh, of the IATP staff to talk about this program that uh, we call the GFPP, the Good Food Purchasing Program. Um, the GFPP was passed in LA as an ordinance, uh, and it contains not only the four values, health, environment, agriculture, and labor, but also local. And that paradigm of those five values is now the law of the land in LA for any company that wants to sell food to the city uh, or to the school district. And combined, it's about $2.75 billion worth of uh, food that the city of LA buys every year, uh, affecting millions of people. And so the fact now is that if you are a company and you're trying to sell food to the city of LA, you need to have good working conditions for your workers. Your food cannot negatively impact the environment. You have to have good uh, agricultural practices and you have to be able to prove that your food is nutritious. Those are now <coughs> reality, the reality of the food system in LA. Uh, it's just a, it's right now it's just a public sector, right? It's only affecting uh, food that is bought by the city of LA and the Unified School District. In our plan, we see that same policy spreading to other cities. That's actually what I was talking to the um, IATP staff earlier about, is doing something like that here in the Twin Cities. Um, and we see it potentially expanding into the private sector. Right? We see something like that as a potential blueprint for standards across both the public and the private sector. Um, so we're excited both because this is a reality. It happened in LA. If it happens in LA, <laughs> it, it can happen in other cities. Trust me, LA is a hot mess when it comes mm -hmm. to uh, city politics. Um, and, it's, and it's something that gives all of us, I think, a specific um, role, right? So regardless of whether you come at food from the environmental impact that it has, or whether you come at it from the human impact, or even animal welfare, all of those are represented in this GFPP program. And so all of them are going to be, or it, in, in my view, it's the best silo buster for the food movement, right? It is the best way to break everybody out of their specific individual silos because the reality is that that crappy food that we're eating that's destroying our bodies is also destroying our environment and bringing wages down for everybody. So I will leave it at that and, uh, oh, sorry, to end it up. But I'll leave it at that and, and hopefully there's questions, answers. Yeah.
Insults? Yeah. <laughs> yes? Can you tell us how you define the food system? When you say that number of 20 million people in the food system, what are, what are the parameters around that? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's five segments in the food system. There's agriculture, which is uh, the production, right? So farm workers. There's food processing. So that does include meat and poultry processing, butchering, etc. There is um, logistics, so everything from transportation to warehousing to freezing, um, and then the retail end, both restaurants and the grocery stores. That's the food system in its entirety, those five sectors. Yeah. So I wanted to defend, um, you'll be happy to know that among academics who aren't always integrated very well with activists, there's been a long debate about this consumer versus worker on food. Um, mm. Jack Kloppenberg, who wrote First the Seed, and he would add to agriculture even before you get to the workers, there's the, the seed mm -hmm. and the ground and the environment. Um, but there's a woman whose name I am completely forgetting and should know, but wrote a scathing review of sort of food first and, and um, that and she is in California and she wrote a book about strawberries and workers in the strawberry field. And I think it was an attack on this very idea of good food. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to, to give people like Jack Klumberg and everybody who worked on good food and thinking about where food was sourced, there was a, initially a real concern about um, the conditions under which food was produced. I spent time in Africa and spent a lot of time working on things like fair trade coffee, fair trade bananas. Um, fair trade was initially established in Holland by some Dutch doctors who were really concerned, like your mother had been, about the conditions under which people were living in poor countries. And so fair trade and thinking about food and where food came from initially came from a concern about the farmers and, the, and trying to get a better, just as paying a wage to a worker is a better price, paying a better farm price to a farmer is a better wage. Mm -hmm. And that became, that was initially it, but in marketing fair trade coffee in the United States and elsewhere, they were marketing to upscale consumers. And so they were marketing on quality. And it's that local food kind of took off among upscale consumers in a way that I think that the people who initially promoted fair trade had not in intended. It was not their purpose, and I, I know because I was involved with that movement for quite some time. We could care less the impact of fair trade coffee on the health of American consumers. I don't buy organic grapes because I care about their impact on me. I care uh, worry deeply about the pesticides that are sprayed on the workers that harvest mm -hmm. the grapes. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think to give credit to the people who initially started this food movement, there was a deep concern about the conditions under which food was being farmed and harvested. Absolutely. It did, and I think then among academics, there was a big debate. My own advisors, more from the labor, my former advisor was more from the labor perspective than the food perspective. And so there is an ongoing debate, but, and I have, I have lived in Portland, I have lived that chicken. <laughs> I, I know it, I know what you're talking about. It drives me completely bonkers. But I would say in farm country, paying a higher wage for food, higher, higher price for food is the same as paying a higher wage for food workers. And I would put in your food system, which is really nice, even before you harvest the food, it mm -hmm. has to be planted. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, that, Absolutely. I just wanted to defend fair wage workers mm -hmm. because they were not concerned about the health of Americans at mm -hmm. the time they were doing yeah. They really Absolutely. weren't, so I just want to say, and I mean, I think the bottom line, <clears throat> if you get anything from what I'm telling you today, is that everything is interconnected. Right. So if, if workers, so I'll, I'll give you the example of uh, Coalition of Immokalee Workers. Do you know Coalition of Immokalee Workers? Yeah. So they have signed, um, I think it's up to 14 now, agreements in the program that they call the Fair Food Program. Um, the fair food program essentially is a penny more per pound of tomato for the tomatoes that tomato pickers pick in the field uh, of Immokalee, Florida. That penny more, it might sound like it's minuscule, but it actually has raised the standard of living for, 
for all of the people of Immokalee, not just for the uh, tomato pickers, but everyone else. And the interesting thing about that is that it also has had a health impact, right? So people who are now earning more money are able to now buy better food or, you know, have a better quality of life. They can, you know, drop off their kids at school in the morning instead of getting up at 3 a.m. and dropping the kids off at a babysitter and not seeing the kid until 8 p.m. when they come home, right? And so there's been this tremendous shift in the way that that community, um, the standards of living of that community. Uh, and, and that, even though that wasn't the intention, right? It wasn't, the intention was not, let's create a, a program for health <laughs> for workers. It was, let's create better working conditions and better wages. It had an impact on, on the health of people. So I, you know, I want to emphasize, right? All of these things are deeply interconnected. And so it is possible, I think, for folks to focus on one thing and have an outcome that lifts up all of the boats. Um, the problem with it, to me, is more of a, it's more of a tactical problem, right? So it's more, if we're working towards a good food procurement policy in the Twin Cities and we don't have good, uh, strong labor representation, how likely is it going to be to get dropped off from the final legislation, right? It's probably more I would agree with you. I do. The number of times I have foamed at the mouth about focusing on consumers instead of workers, which mm -hmm. surprised you given the critique I just made. I just worry because then I see two groups of good people who really are um, working towards the same end yeah. in the oh, same right. way. Mm -hmm. Some and and those good people, maybe some of them, the ones who are concerned about where they're, you know, the ones we mock in Portland, who really are as silly as one might imagine. Um, have forgotten, but there are two good groups of people who maybe are spending too much energy fighting each other, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. my only concern. Yeah, no, I, we're we're on the same page. Yeah. Absolutely, that has to go away. Yes. Uh, well, congratulations on uh, getting the ordinance passed in Los Angeles. It's really quite a political achievement. I, I was just wondering how have uh, the food uh, distributors like Cisco responded? I mean, have they gone to court to try to get the ordinance annulled, or what has been the response of the larger food distributors? Yeah, you know, surprisingly, it's been, I think, because from the beginning, we engaged good employers, so Bon Appetit was actually part of the drafting of the legislation. Um, there was not a lot of space for other food providers to argue against it. That being said, I don't expect that to be the case everywhere. I think LA was a unique situation. Um, there were a lot of very deep relationships in the mayor's office with a lot of folks in, um, in business. And that prevented a lot of the fight back that we would normally see in other cities and other situations. I think it's gonna be different in every city, right? I think I, I'm, we're doing the same thing right now in Chicago um, and in Oakland and in New York. And I can tell you the, the response in Oakland is, couldn't be more different than the response from Chicago, right? It's mm -hmm. very, very different. It's like night and day. Mm -hmm. right? The Oakland City Council and the folks uh, in general in, in Oakland, the community in Oakland, is actually going beyond what the GFPP, what the, uh, what the standards are in the GFPP, um, and, and talking about gentrification and, and a, a ton of other really important issues that are also connected, uh, but that are not necessarily directly related to food. And so it's it's amazing that, and then in, you know, in Chicago, um, we have a situation where, I hope this is, I hope put it on YouTube after the election. Uh, we have a very hotly contested election, uh, and it was like pulling teeth to get the candidates. We got both of them to respond positively and say that they would do it. But it was, you know, it was like trying to get, um, trying to get one of them to do something horrible to their mother, you know. <laughs> we can edit that out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have a lot of things going on here. You uh, say, and it's, I know it's true, that uh, employers uh, test the uh, free market by, well, violating the laws, you know how. Well, they can go and, and still get away with it and uh, without getting caught. Uh, what happens when they do get caught would be one question. Are there actually laws that 
even annoy them. <laughs> There's been some really creative strategies uh, on the part of some worker centers out there that are, I think, innovative enough that have created an, a, an impact, a pretty deep impact in, in employer behavior. Um, one of them is a, a lean um, strategy. So, especially in construction, if you improve the value of a property um, and you are not paid for your work in improving that property, you have a right to the property. Not the whole property, but the equal amount of the value of your work to that property. So you get a lien on the property. <laughs> um, that's been a really effective strategy. And the reason that worker centers have had to um, go to that extreme, if you will, um, is because you know we have a pretty dysfunctional labor law system. Uh, it's not, it, I, I heard this somewhere, so I don't know if this is 100% accurate, but um, there's less than uh, 3,000, I think, labor uh, investigators in the DOL, in the Department of Labor. Um, for just the restaurant industry, over 900,000 eating and drinking establishments, just in the restaurant industry. Right? So you're talking about, a, a, you know, it's like a beat cop trying to walk a block that's from here to Chicago. Right? Uh, they never get to, to see all of, the, all of the possible violations. And so, so, yeah, so people have gotten creative and they've used, you know, uh, the law that, that it, it was not intended necessarily for that purpose um, to get back the money that's owed to them. And Chicago is one of the, my towns, a territory that I have some familiarity with, but I haven't seen the corner, the street corner where you say, I'm going to estimate that a number of them are uh, the largely men c competing uh, to uh, lower their wages to get hired. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, the old, that's the free market, yeah, that the Republicans would like all of us workers to <laughs> submit to so we would no negotiate freely with our employer in every instance until wages are so low that the whole system collapses anyway. But is that a sore point in the movement in Chicago? What might the movement do? I mean, is, and do they bid their wages down even below the minimum wage is another question. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, those are both excellent questions. So it's not just in Chicago and it's not just in one street corner. Um, it's a pretty widespread phenomenon that is referred to as day labor. Um, and so there's been a lot of organizations that have been um, specifically created or that, you know, day labor is created to address some of the issues that are uh, embedded in that industry. There's now a national uh, organization that sort of brings all of those organizations together called the National Day Labor Organizing Network, oh. or Endelon. <laughs> uh, and they do a fantastic job of both educating workers about the rights that they have in the workplace, including what the minimum wage is in the state, what kinds of laws apply to them, uh, depending on what industry they're working in. Mostly it's construction, but it's a number of other industries as well. Um, and they've now uh, created, I think which is one of the, the innovative things I think that you wanted me to talk about is this sort of cooperative uh, so that workers are not just going out and working for other people, but that they actually work for themselves, right? That they create some of that wealth themselves and share it amongst themselves. Um, so there's some, there is some really innovative, and it, not, not everything that I'm saying today is negative, bad news, sad, and blue. There's a lot of hope. Um, and if there is one other thing that I would want to leave you with, um, is that there's a real movement underfoot, uh, mostly by worker centers, right? Mostly by, um, and when I say worker centers, I don't know if everyone knows what I'm talking about. They're essentially, they are um, market intervention organizations controlled by workers uh, that fit this new economy, right? So they're not unions, uh, but they act like unions in some ways, right? They uh, have a market intervention 
uh, strategy in their particular sector, in their particular industry. Uh, and so there's a number of these worker centers that have emerged over the course of the last 15 years. A lot of them now have formed national coalitions like Endalon. Rock United is actually a national coalition of restaurant worker organizations. Um, and there's others, right? There's the National Domestic Workers Alliance and so forth. Uh, and a lot of these worker centers share one common trait, which is that they are all propositive organizations. They are all proposing changes that are positive rather than defending things or rather than um, attempting to fight back against some of the attacks from the right or from you know, uh, employers or whatever. Um, that, that common trait, I think, sets them apart from a lot of, uh, not just from traditional labor, but from a lot of other organizations that, that came before. Uh, because they're not, they're all attempting to create something new, right? They're all trying to uh, move forward in, uh, in dire straits, right? So we're all stuck in this sort of sinking boat. But instead of uh, focusing on plugging the hole, these folks are building a new boat, right? And they're moving forward on that boat. Um, so there's some really... Um, beautiful examples of this, right, and, and some really great organizations that are doing some fantastic work, um, especially in those three industries. Those three industries, to me, represent uh, sort of the tip of the iceberg of the informal economy, the new economy, uh, with those traits that I mentioned earlier, uh, which if you reverse, right, are the reasons why there's such a decimation of unions. It's the same reasons. It's the, it's the reverse of those reasons, right? It's that the demographic shift it is a uh, new economic model that doesn't fit the industrial union model. Uh, and, and it has this sort of effect on unions that as the union shrinks, they have less resources to organize new workers. Right? So it's this vicious cycle. Uh, and, and that's just the reality of a shifting economy. I'm wondering if you could say some words about um, the link with immigration reform, um, the, how, how Rock and how, how you, um, uh, how do, how do un undocumented workers come into your, into your sphere and just say something about yeah. the side of Yeah, this. no, it's, it's another great question. So, yeah, there's, a, there's over 13, we estimate over 13 million undocumented workers in the United States now. Um, most of these workers are from Latin America, although there's workers from all over the world that are undocumented. Uh, and they're in, in every industry. They're not uh, in only one place or one industry, although there's huge concentrations of them in those three industries that I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, and in the food system as a whole, there's a a, a, an over sample of, of that population. We've, so we've seen a couple of things in the last five years. One is that because there's a state of inaction at the federal level um, in terms of immigration reform, uh, there has been, and, and because there's a reaction at the state level that's actually negative, right? In, in most states, um, where there, wh wherever a state has tried to act <coughs> on its own on immigration, it is uh, it's been negative. It's been it's been bad for immigrants. Uh, Arizona is obviously the most blatant example of that with SB ten seventy and, and some of the other state laws, mm -hmm. um, essentially criminalizing immigrants, right? Uh, but there's tons of other states. Georgia is a, another horrible one that did essentially the same thing that Arizona did, but didn't get the same attention in the news media. Um, and so those two realities have created a almost a permanent underclass, right? It's created the sense in the immigrant community that things are not going to change. They're not going to change now, and they're not going to change ever. And so the only way to survive, the only way to subsist as a community is to create the kinds of organizations that provide that sort of mutual support. Uh, and so the fabric of the community as a result of this has gotten a lot stronger. 
Um, we've seen, you know, everything from individual uh, folks who die and the community just, there's outpouring of support for, the, for that community, for that uh, person, uh, all the way to, you know, larger fights against individual employers or, or large corporations like the Coalition of Immokalee Workers that I mentioned earlier. Um, that really sort of highlights this new reality that, that undocumented immigrants are living in. Mm -hmm. uh, now, all of that being said, <laughs> that doesn't mean that we should all just give up on uh, comprehensive immigration reform, right? It, it means that um, we really do have to think about both strategies of galvanizing that newfound power. Um, and it's not just the outpouring of support for individual situations. I'm, you know, I'm also, uh, everyone here, although Twin Cities I don't think had the gigantic marches, but everywhere else in the country there were huge marches uh, up to five years ago around immigration reform. Mm -hmm. um, and th that's the kind of energy that's, that's dissipating now, but it's the, the, the current of the community is still there. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is both we need to push on federal immigration reform and we need to find ways of galvanizing or, or creating pathways for communities, uh, immigrant communities, to be engaged in that struggle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A question just about the, where does kind of um, the conversation about moving workers into ownership, I mean, you mentioned something mm -hmm. about cooperatives, but I'm wondering how much of that is part of the organizing is to really kind of, is to, is to, is to take back some of the ownership, just seeing how many businesses are increasingly consolidated um, and how much leverage can be created there as a worker versus leverage created as maybe worker owners? That's an excellent question. There's, there's, so there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of efforts to create cooperative ownership uh, in the food system. Um, I think some of the, the examples that probably here most of us are familiar with are consumer cooperatives, um, which I think are, are a very different animal than a worker cooperative. Um, and a lot of what we're doing at the Food Chain Workers Alliance is trying to connect those cooperatives, both the consumer cooperatives and the worker cooperatives, with a larger movement uh, for worker justice, right? So it's not just these isolated pockets of, um, you know, good intention, but it, that they're actually connected strategically to a larger um, project for, for equity. Um, and it's hard, right? I mean, I'll be honest with you, there's, it, it, there's no, it's not like the worker center movement or the union movement where there's sort of larger strategies to identify <coughs> an industry or a sector and that that sector could become cooperative, cooperatively owned, maybe? <laughs> you all know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> You know, if that were the case, then I think we'd be on good footing, right? If, there, if, if cooperatives had any kind of infrastructure to say nationally, we're gonna focus on the food system as a place to develop cooperatives and actually become powerful, have power, have uh, density, right? So that we could then negotiate from a point of leverage vis-a-vis -vis other industries and vis-a-vis -vis employers. Uh, that doesn't exist in the cooperative movement, right? There's no strategic thinking about how to take over a sector or a segment of the economy. Um, and that's what we need. So that's I'll leave it at that. But I think I think you know there's there's potential for it. The cooperative movement is not young. It's been around for a long time, but there's iterations of it, right? And so we're in this in this new iteration of it that I think is really interesting because it's the first time that we're seeing both women and uh, people of color in large numbers and leadership roles in the cooperative movement. Um, so that creates a different dynamic for the movement. Uh, so I'm hopeful. <laughs> I'm thinking it might happen, but you know, but I gotta say yes. I'm gonna be really boring and get back to farming again. I'm just talking about those people that eat uh -huh. But where you do see that happening Being away. is that um, <laughs> so much of the labor, of course, on farms is done by immigrants. And so you mm -hmm. do see some movement, some attempts, for instance, in the farm bills where it was possible to make it possible for the people who work on the land to buy the farms. And so when I was out west in Oregon, you do see, you know, attempts to funnel loans and funnel money so that people who've been working on the property for many, many generations, in fact, can mm -hmm. buy it. 
And you see, and that then becomes, they become the owners of the farm and so the labor they do then goes back to them and then they sell the goods and make the profit from it. Um, part of that comes out of, you may be aware of the deep racism in this country around, there's been an ongoing it's struggle to there. get, yeah. <laughs> you may be aware, but in the South to get back, the, there is a profound discrimination um, in the farm policy and the, the remuneration given to African Americans for their farms as opposed to white Americans. And so there is some success around that and allowing African Americans and Southern farmers to buy their land. And so in, in pushing for that, there was also a push to help immigrant farmers, or not, or even legal status farmers, mm -hmm. to buy the lands which they had been sharecropping or working on. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, becoming owners of the land. And sometimes when you own a farm, you're always trying to do higher value. So you might start a restaurant based off of that. You might, in Minnesota, do God knows what. Um, butter <laughs> or bread. Um, in Minnesota doesn't have a lot of added value off of its farm products. But once you own the farm, then you do see a link to the restaurant as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm aware of those movements to get people who work on the land to own the land. Yeah, um, I, I'm sure everybody here knows uh, the rural coalition. Yeah. They, they, they really have a much better finger on the pulse of exactly what you're talking about than I do. It's, it was the only thing I could think of, because that was the first mm -hmm. single stick that I was going to beat today. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I wondered about um, Walmart's announcement recently about increasing wages, and, yeah. and if, what you think about you know, how big a deal that is. Is that something that will reverberate a little bit throughout? I know at least here in Minnesota, people are saying, well, Target, what's up? Are you going to step up now? Mm -hmm. Does that is that, and now make them, does that make it uh, the push for McDonald's to raise wages stronger? What is, what is the effect you think? Yeah, well, it's, it's <laughs> Walmart is an interesting case study because of its size and because of its supply chain strategy. Um, one thing that we have noted is that, and there's a report out just keep your ears to the ground on this one. We will be publishing a report um, June, first week of June on Walmart. Uh, we've did, we did a pretty in-depth study. We went into, uh, we, we went into uh, Walmarts and looked at their products and then the background research on the products that claim to be organic, sustainable, local, all that stuff. Um, and what we found is, you know, probably not surprising in this room, but it would be surprising, I think, to the general public, um, that a lot of those products, um, their claims are just not true, um, especially their claims of fairness, right? When it comes to the, the, both the environment and to labor, they fall short. Um, and two really interesting things about that is, one, Walmart has a code of conduct for their supply chain. Uh, that's actually not bad. If you read through it, it's actually you know, not excellent either, but it's, it's okay. Um, and, and two, that a lot, of the, a lot of the suppliers are actually not just breaking the code of conduct, but breaking the law. They're not even upholding the most basic standards. Um, and so what we're proposing to Walmart, or what we, we will be proposing to Walmart um, is the creation of a third-party independent monitoring uh, vehicle of some sort for that, for their own code of conduct, um, which we don't think is a, a huge ask. And on the heels of their um, uh, announcement that they're going to be raising the wages, I think it's not necessarily you know crazy to think that they could potentially do something like this. Um, why are they raising raising the wages? Right. I mean, I think everybody knows. The truth to that is that there's been a lot of pressure on them, and there's been um, tons of uh, actions, including hunger strikes and all these Black Friday actions. Every Black Friday, there's been a huge action in every Walmart that I know of, at least. Um, and so it's been it's been years in the making, right? It's been something that that workers have fought really hard to get. Uh, that being said, it's not anywhere near what it should be, right? It's nowhere near the, the amount that workers should make. 
Um, it will have, my belief personally, I'm not an economist, but my belief is that it will have a pull effect. Um, anytime you have an employer that large, you know, going back to the, the auto industry days, right, when uh, the big three all raised wages after the UAW organized them, it had this huge pull effect for the entire manufacturing sector, right? That's what created the middle class of the 50s and 60s and 70s. That, um, Walmart is not gonna create the middle class, unfortunately, <laughs> not by raising the minimum wage, you know, to $10 an hour. Um, but it's, it's gonna have a pull effect. It's gonna, it's, it's gonna create uh, more demand for higher wages in other similar retail settings. Uh, which is good, right? Because that's the, the bulk of our jobs in this economy. Um, so, like, correct me if I'm wrong with the numbers, but you said that the Food Chain Workers Alliance represents 20 something organizations, is that right? 23, yeah. And then there are, did you say 250,000 maybe workers represented within that? Mm -hmm. So, I'm curious how you kind of directly call upon the workers to be involved in kind of the organizing. I'm sure a lot of the organizers are former or current food chain workers also, but how do you kind of? from their direct experience? Yeah, it's a great question. So it's, it's a number of different things, right? I mean, the, the good food procurement policy um, is probably the best example to highlight how we do it. Um, so GFPP contains these five values, right? The health, environment, agriculture, labor, and local. Um, most workers uh, have a vague understanding of either some or all of those values. Uh, but no one, including me, or anyone in this room, has a perfect understanding of all of those values, right? Um, but if we share with each other what we know about those values, then we can actually um, not just inform each other, but create the kind of consciousness that's necessary to move the policy, right? So that's a lot of pretty words. Well, how do we do that, right? So. It's alignment, and in my mind, it's like, you know, if, if I'm a worker, I can know my experience with, with my own flesh and bones really well. And I can describe it to someone who is a public health advocate, and they can describe to me issues of public health, right? Or how food affects public health or whatever, right? Like the, the sort of the, the connection of those two issues. Um, so what we're planning on doing is in order to create that alignment of health, environment, agriculture, labor, and local, we're doing a series that we're calling Food Chain Ambassadors right now, just because we don't have a better name. If anyone here comes up with a better name, let me know. Ask the people of a rock. Yeah. <laughs> really, some cool acronym. <laughs> Um, no, don't ask the people over there. <laughs> Especially not in Minnesota, in Minneapolis. So if you want to succeed here, don't go down that path. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the, the, the idea is that all five of those values are aligned and not just in this theoretical, like, I'll explain to you what, you know, environmentally sound food is, but that you actually get someone who's been affected by a CAFO, for instance, a confined animal feeding operation, and you have them explain to a worker what that was like, right? And the worker explains to that person what it's like to work in, you know, a butchering operation or something, right? I mean, it's the idea is that all five of those values are uh, intertwined and explained to each other through the experiences of the people who live them, uh, so that we come out of that process with a deep understanding of how those how the lack of that value affects human beings, how it affects our lives and the earth. So it's a, it's a long process and I'm like sighing in the process of explaining it to you guys. It's a long process, but the idea is that we would do trainings, bringing folks together to do that alignment that, that you know, mm -hmm. it's a popular education term, it's the exchange of experiences, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea is that then through that, People will understand all five of the values from a lived experience place, be able to go back to their communities and organize to pass good food procurement policies in their communities. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Sir. A question about you, just the thinking about the day labor market, you know, on the street and, and how that so much of this is workers are divided by competition and scarcity of just like, yeah in terms of like uniting in a force 
who can do it for the least amount, you know? And especially in, in creating division. So I'm like, I'm curious about how in bringing the Food Chain Workers Alliance together, where those wedges are that are very intentionally meant to split the various sectors of the, where those are and how you deal with competition and that's kind of scarcity in terms of, you know, having a values-based <laughs> conversation in order to kind of bring cohesion. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there's intentional wedges all over the place, right? There's intentional <laughs> wedges around race, around gender, um, and around positionality, both in terms of class and, and social setting. Um, those wedges, I think, are easier to deal with because they've been, they're institutionalized and there's words for them, right? Um, the ones that are harder are, what's the difference between back of the house and front of the house in the restaurant industry, right? And how do you describe that so that it isn't, um, so that it isn't divisive, right? And that, that wedge is something that is real. There is a real difference between folks who work in the back of the house and folks who work in the front of the house. Notwithstanding, or not meant, you know, I'm not talking about race or gender or any of the other obvious ones, but just actual differences in the way people behave and act and the skills that they have, etc. That's hard, right? And so that those, the exploration of how much more similar we are than different is the first and fundamental base from which you start. Uh, and then you layer on top of that how those divisions are meant to create the kind of environment that benefits the boss, right? So it's always about who benefits from division, who benefits from us not being able to connect on X issue, right? Uh, if that's the frame and the lens from which you're looking at issues, I think you get to a place that's a lot more uh, that where you're a lot more able to address the root cause of the issue rather than just dealing with the symptoms and trying to mitigate differences and uh, ultimately you end up going in circles if you if you do that right if you just talk about the sort of the identity politics of it all right I mean it makes a it makes a difference more than you would think uh, so there's a restaurant in Washington D.C. called Plus Boys and Poets you guys heard of that place. Um, the owner is this guy, Andy Shalal, who's um, the president of Ray's. He's, he runs the, well, he, he's, he and, and a few other restaurant owners run the Rock Restaurant Association. He, hi he intentionally hires people of color to work in the front of the house um, and, and has, you know, the, the percentage is, is almost crazy, right? It's like 90-something percent of people in the front of the house are people of color and women. Um, and, and the kind of environment that exists in that restaurant is radically different than what you would find in other restaurants. And what ends up happening there is that people, first of all, they don't want to leave, right? The turnover rate in the restaurant industry, I don't know if you guys know this, is about 300%, right? Which means in the course of one year, a restaurant will have three completely different staffs. <laughs> For the course of that year, um, and Andy's restaurant is less than less than ten percent, right? So people want to stay in the restaurant. So that is a shift in the in the, in the culture of that restaurant in and of itself, right there. Uh, so people are actually there longer, so that the culture actually builds itself, right? It's not just a sort of glimmering hope of the future, right? It's actually happening on the ground. Um, that's obviously not going to be the case once you leave that restaurant and you go work somewhere else, right? And so that's, that's the, 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 the sort of the wall, right? And so because that's the wall and because where people are hitting that wall, they now have tools to confront it. Um, it's, not, it's, it, it's hopeful to think that those tools will be used, right? And that we will eventually deconstruct those walls that, that people are hitting and create something new. I'm thinking back to that question about small co-ops versus McDonald's. And you know, the reason you go stand on the street corner and bid yourself down is because you have no other alternative. And mm -hmm. co-ops create that alternative, and restaurants like the one you create create that alternative, but they're small alternatives. It is, mm -hmm. for instance, yes, debate among people who've been promoting sustainable organics 
a very, very thin wedge of the overall market. Yeah. And is it, and you know, getting Starbucks to go organic while it kills us was a big thing and mm -hmm. really affected, you know, where coffee was sourced from. I mean, I get to drink our Starbucks again. But so on the one hand, there's hope and the alternative posed by this, it's the smallness of these alternatives, is I think, versus the pressure on the big chains oh, yeah. like McDonald's. And I think, Partly the reason for the success of the tomato, the one one cent in Florida was the pressure on Taco Bell. Enormous pressure was put on Taco Bell and boycotts and demonstrations in front of Taco Bell. And it was because such a large chain was affected that workers in Florida were able to get that one cent in free. So I'm torn between the hope represented by the flourishing of small restaurants like the one you've described in DC and, and loving to see them you know, sprout up all over the country and the reality of putting pressure on places like yeah. McDonald's and Wendy's and Taco Bell. Oh yeah, no, so. no. I, yeah. Let me respond to that. Sure, go, is it, I, go for it. It's and both, right? I mean, there is definitely no way that we're going to change our food system if we all stop what we're doing and just grow our own food and you know start our own cooperative restaurants and all that. That's not gonna change the food system. Right. There's still going to be a Walmart, there's still going to be a Monsanto, there's still going to be you know, a whole lot of different actors out there who have only one interest, and that's profits. Um, so it, it has to be both. We have to be able to, and, and, and we have to stop thinking of them as dichotomies. We have to stop thinking of them as you know, mutually exclusive. They're actually, they, they need each other. We need to be able to imagine what the future is going to look like. And that's why these examples are, even though they're small and mm -hmm. insignificant in, in terms of the scale of them, um, they're hugely significant in terms of the, the morale of the story, the, the moral of the story and the morale <laughs> that it gives us. Um, and, and, but we can't give up on the fight, right? Like the fight is ultimately how we're going to win, right? If we're just building this alternative without deconstructing what's already there, um, we're not going to ever reach that equilibrium that we need. Just a, maybe a closing question. Yes. Um, it takes us. It takes workers in the U.S. and puts them in the global, into the global context, mm -hmm. the global food system. Um, and I'm just wondering, in the alliance, um, how you introduce, or how the workers introduce, the members' organizations introduce or are, are exposed to the kinds of decisions and rules that are being made uh, at levels that, that mm -hmm. are even beyond, you know, that are sort of kind of invisible. So, of course, I'm referring to kind of trade agreements mm -hmm. and what that means for procurement programs, for example, or what it could mean for procurement programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's... We're, we're confronting a new reality when it comes to trade agreements, especially in TPP and, and the vastness of that potential. Um, and I do think that it could have a hugely destructive power on a lot of the really good stuff that we've done in the last few years. Um, and so it, it is imperative for people to organize to stop it. Uh, that being said, I think there's, um, it is part of the alignment process, right? It is part of like helping all of us understand how that will affect us, right? I mean, if you talk to the average poultry worker in Northwest Arkansas, they probably won't know what the TPP is, right? And they probably will be equally um, shrugging shoulders about what they should do about it. So. It's, it's really developing the, the tools and the skills that we need ourselves mm -hmm. to fight, but also how do, we, how do we not keep the fight in this room, right? Yeah. How do we actually yeah. bring the, the grassroots up with us and how do we bring the grass tops down yeah. to us? All right. Well, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.